Are you interested in debugging a system with a RISC-V core? In this video, I will be showing you what basic debugging and trace of a RISC-V core will look like with Lauterbox Trace32. We're finding that many customers have processor with cores of different architectures, so I'll also show you debugging an environment that includes RISC-V and ARM cores and how you can control the interaction of those cores with Trace32. My name is Dennis Griffith, and I am an FAE for Lauterbach, supporting the Western US. So let's get started. If you've used Trace32 before, this will look very familiar. We keep the GUI the same between the different architectures. Of course, there are some differences because the architectures are different, but the GUI will feel very, very familiar to you. This is a single core debug session. I am going to show you some of the things that are available, starting off first with registers. So we're going to look at the main registers here. Now you'll find that it's very easy to modify them. You just double click on a value and you add the value and hit return. And of course this is all done from the command line. You can see the stack, um, see where that's, you know, the values of the stack and the stack pointer. But if you want a more abstract view, we have the ability to look at stack frames, and you'll see that here. With this, you can go up and down the stack to see what the call sequence has been. In this case, we started off with start in our uh, loader, which then goes to main, which then calls the sieve function where we're stopped right now. You can see arguments and control that. You can see the various local values, and you can see what the caller looks like in your source code. In addition to the basic registers, we have the what we call the peripheral view. This will show you registers that are of peripherals that are attached in your chip. So you'll bring that up. You'll be able to expand it and look at the various registers that are there. In this case, we're going to look at some counters that are built in. You'll notice that these values are changing they will change even though the core is not running and it will give you a live view. So if some other agent affects that, you'll see it change. Next, we're going to look at the list view. We'll just type in list. And you'll notice that there are different views that you can see. Starting off with the assembly view that shows you basically just the object code. It does show labels. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the high-level language view that shows you your source code. And then in between, there is a mix of high-level language and the assembly language. And we have this convenient button that will allow you to toggle between the two. In the list window, you can see variable values. You can actually set breakpoints very easily by double clicking. In this case, I'm going to set a breakpoint at the end of the function. We will go there, and then we can look at the values that are in that. So in this case, we're looking at the various values just to see what they are when we were done executing it. We could have stopped halfway in the middle and saw the values in, in the middle. I'm going to set a breakpoint on sieve and show you the breakpoint window. This will be a list of all your breakpoints. Um, it's fairly sophisticated. Um, so I'm going to delete that one and I'm going to show you actually what an advanced one is. Um, lots of features, but I'm going to show the count. So there, when we do sieve, it will count the number of times we do it, and it'll count up, and you see that it's 10, and then it stopped. Now something you'll notice is that when it hit that breakpoint, it highlighted it. If I had other breakpoints, they would not have been highlighted. This is very convenient, particularly in an SMP environment where you have multiple cores, or an OS, or hypervisor environment. This will show you the breakpoint that caused the CPU to stop and it'll switch context to that core if, if you have multiple cores. 
So next, I'm going to show you the trace features that are in this chip. This design of this chip has um, an on-chip trace buffer. It's about 4K deep. Well, it's 4K deep. We can use that to look at some events and things of code leading up to it. I've already collected some trace. You can see in the trace list window, basically this is a record of where you have been, where it came from. We can control the amount of detail with the more and less buttons. So if you click less, you'll eventually see just the high level language. If you click more, you can go down and see more and more details. This window here shows you the various functions that it's been in. You can think of it as a sequence diagram laying on its side. Um, it will show you the sequence of calls that occurred. Not only will it show you the sequence, it'll show you the nesting, and that's what that thin line is all about. This window here is statistics that it has gathered by looking at the trace. From this, it can determine several things, doing a lot of the timing analysis. It'll also do a call analysis. You can see that's what the count is. It's telling you that function one, for example, was called four times. It spent 157 microseconds in the function, both the minimum and the maximum, and thus the average. And from this, you can use it to tune your software and see if your performance uh, improvements have actually made a difference. For this next section, I'm going to show AMP debug, where we have different architectures interacting with each other. We actually have three cores. We have two ARM cores and one RISC-V. One of the ARM cores is going to be running in the background, generating a square wave, and interacting with data structures that is shared between the other ARM and the RISC-V. OK, here you can see the different GUIs. So we have two GUIs. This one here is controlling the ARM processor, the ARM core. This one is controlling the RISC-V processor core. The third one you don't see in the system because it's in the background and Trace32 is not managing it. So when we click start on the RISC-V core, you see it running. When we press stop, it stops. Same with the ARM. Now a key thing to note is that they are starting and stopping independently, and that third core in the background is not being controlled by Trace32, so it's always running. So what happens if you want to be able to start and stop them synchronously? We have this command called sync that creates this bus that allows signals to transfer back and forth between the two. So in this case, I'm setting up the RISC-V. I'm telling it I want to send signals over to the ARM processor and telling it that I'm both going to send and receive signals. Doing the same with the ARM, and it's telling it it's going to connect up to the RISC-V. The thing to realize that third core in the background is not going to be controlled. So now that I have this set up, if I start either of the cores, the other one will start. And if I stop them, they both stop. Again, that third core in the background is still running. So it doesn't matter which combination, although you notice in that dialog there were combinations. You can create some interesting interactions if you'd like. Next, I'm going to show you what happens when we set a breakpoint. There really isn't a great opportunity in this code for breakpoints, so I'm going to have to set an advanced breakpoint. So what I'll do is I'll go into the break list. I will find that breakpoint. I will change it. I will go to the advanced tab and put in a count of 100 and it will count down and when it fires then uh, both uh, processors will stop. When we run it, notice the little red S. This is known as an intrusive breakpoint. It means that that was, is not running at real time and you can see that in the graph. That is just the nature of intrusive breakpoints. They are not real time. Okay, that's all the time I have right now. We barely scratched the surface of the capabilities of the tool, but I've shown you some of the basic debug mechanisms of on-chip trace, uh, the ability to interact between asymmetric cores on a chip. If you have further questions, contact us at the virtual booth or directly from our website. 
Okay, have a great show.